right. It is good to be saved. This is going to be an interesting night. <clears throat> it's going to be a really interesting night because I'm correcting Devin about the song page. He said 320, and I said, no, brother, it's 320. That would be the same thing, amen? And so, hallelujah, God is good. Yeah, it certainly will. And I kept on saying the wrong words, too, so it was an interesting song service. Hallelujah. And so God is good. You pray for me. Amen. All right, looking at our Bibles, if you would please go to Psalm chapter number 2, verses 1 through 12. Verses 1 through 12, I got an update from Mrs. Boyd. And uh, they got all the tissue off. There was some tissue left, so they didn't go all the way to the bone of his heel, which was a blessing. And so they've got it uh, bandaged up right now. And uh, just be praying that come this Friday when they take the bandage off, that uh, the flesh is pink. And because if it's not, then they're going to have to do more. And so just pray that that would be the case with her dad. And his name is uh, Bob Shesher. And so uh, please be doing that. Amen. And then uh, let's see here. Uh, chapter number two of the book of Psalms. Let's read verses one through 12 once again. The Bible says in verse number 1 of chapter number 2 of Psalms, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven, heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession." Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. And ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Can I get a witness right there? Amen. Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. Lord, I pray now that you'd fill me, use me, God, direct my thoughts and my words. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would help me to only say what you'd have me to say tonight and refrain me from saying what you do not want me to say. And Father, I pray, dear God, now that you'd open our understanding of the passage we'll be looking at, Lord, and I pray, dear God, that you would just uh, work in our hearts and minds. We sure do love you. We praise you. We thank you. I pray you'd encourage us tonight and strengthen us tonight. So thankful for who you are and what you've done, what you are doing, and what you're going to do. And Father, you're just so good to us. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. I pray you'd watch over those that aren't able to be here. I pray you'd be with those that are watching online. And Lord, I pray, Father, that you just work and move in our midst. And I pray you'd strengthen and help in us. And I do think about uh, Brenda's dad. I pray, Father, that you would put your hand of healing upon his his heel. I pray, dear God, that you would also strengthen the circulation, the blood circulation to his legs, Lord, so that there's better blood flow there. And that, uh, Father, that Friday, that that flesh would be pink and healthy. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd work and move as only you can. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' precious holy name, we pray the power of his blood we plead. Amen. All right, Psalm chapter number two. And so we see in this passage, we're going to be looking at verses seven, eight, and nine. The Lord never has lost a battle. Can I get a witness? God has never lost a battle, and He never will. Everything is going according to plan. God does not lose. Amen. He is victorious in everything. Amen? Now, we may lose because we fail to lean on Him and allow the devil to have victory in our lives, but the bottom line is, is even in those things that take place in our lives, the bottom line is, is the final victory is won. Amen. Amen? Amen? And so I'm thankful for that. Jesus Christ will rule for a thousand years with a rod of iron, and so will we. Amen? Yes. 
That's pretty exciting stuff right there. In 1 Corinthians 10, 26, as we mentioned each week, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to Him. And so as we have asked before, are you living in the knowledge of God's sovereignty? He is faithful, amen? And He is in control. He does know everything. He has all the power, amen? amen. And listen, the bottom line is He's everywhere. He is omnipresent as well. Hey, listen, He's perfect in His justice, His love. He's perfect in His judgment. He's perfect in His mercy, His grace, His long-suffering. Everything God does is always right. Can I get a witness? And everything that He did today is right. Everything He's going to do tomorrow is right. Everything He did yesterday is right. Everything He has allowed to happen throughout all of human history, guess what? He was right for it, amen? He's always right, and that's because He's a pretty awesome God. And uh, I just, praise the Lord, not just a pretty awesome, he's an, He is all awesome, as awesome as cat. He's awesomeness. And so, hallelujah. And so as we look at this, we've looked at verses 1 through 3. We've seen man defiance. We saw their rage, their rapport, and their removal. We saw God's design, His laughter at them, His language to them, and His lofty position over them. And tonight, we're going to be taking a look at God's declaration God's declaration. In the next three verses, God declares His sons, the first thing I want you to notice, His son's position. Look at verse number 7 with me, if you would. Verse number 7. Verse number 7, the Bible says in verse number 7, I will declare the decree. And He's declaring some, three, some things in these next three verses. Can I get a witness? And so, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I what? Begotten thee. Amen. And so we're going to dig into this a little bit. And I don't know if you ever heard anybody preach on uh, 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 what it means by that he is begotten, what that means, what the, the point of that is, and all of those things. And uh, really, when you stop and think about this, this is probably actually one of the harder things to understand in the Bible. It really is. And so as we look at this and we see this, uh, God's declaration, we see His position, His position. The Son of God is revealing a conversation between the Father and Himself that occurred, listen to me, before the foundations of the world. This is a conversation that took place before uh, uh, the, be well, really, before the beginning of creation, amen, and in eternity before, in eternity past. And the Son of God is revealing a conversation between the Father and Himself that occurred before the foundation of the world. In that, the conversation, the decree was given that the Son of God would be the Savior of the world and that God would exalt Him as King of kings and Lord of lords. Can I get a witness? And so you know the Savior of the world, what that means is He became a man, He lived a perfect 33 years, and then He became the perfect sacrifice on an old rugged cross. He, he was brutally beaten and died on the cross, shed His blood, and rose again the third day. And so there's some different ideas about this, but I want you to think about this matter of His position and the fact that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that is what He is saying in this place. He said in verse number 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. This is the decree. Who's the king? My son. That's who the king is. Can I get a witness? And so we see in John 17, verse number 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Man, that's a good thing right there. Amen. That they may behold my what? glory, amen, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. God the Father loved God the Son before the foundation of the world. Can I get a witness? And so he was God the Son before the foundation of the world. Can I get an amen? And which means he was the only begotten son uh, uh, before the foundation of the world. Now, I'm going to get into this a little bit because people teach this different, and I'm going to show you why. And so 1 Peter chapter number 1, go there with me. Let's look at the scriptures. It's better we just turn there. And so 1 Peter chapter number 1, I want you to see this is good stuff. Then again, if it's in the Bible, it's good stuff. Amen. Hallelujah. It's all good in the Word. And so, praise the Lord. I just, 
I love, I just love reading the Bible. I just do. And I was going through the other day looking in Revelation, and I seen where that uh, the, uh, uh, the woman, which is a picture of Israel in Revelation chapter number 12, how that she was delivered on wings of eagles. And I got to thinking about this and wondering about this, and, you know, I haven't done any deep digging on it, but just, you know, if you, if you like to study and dig, take a look around and see what you figure out. And so Revelation chapter number 12, and this is way off target, but anyways, I'm going to do it anyways. And so, because it feels good. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and so anyways, listen, in Revelation chapter number 12, on those wings of eagles, she was delivered uh, from uh, Satan. Okay, to be delivered and have the child and all of that stuff. And so we're talking about Jesus. So it's kind of a parathetical there in Revelation talking about when Jesus was brought and all those things. And so anyways, uh, delivered on wings of eagles. And I got to wondering if maybe the United States of America isn't destroyed before the tribulation period. And those wings of eagles represent the United States of America. Because I can't find anything that says what they represent. Are you with me? And so the eagle is America's symbol, amen, a symbol of freedom, a symbol of deliverance above the storm. And so I wondered that, and I wondered if maybe this country has become so pagan that when the rapture does happen, there's so many people that haven't heard a clear presentation. It got me thinking about that, and maybe I'm going to do a study on that. I got to thinking about how that the Bible says that those that rejected the love of the truth. You know, I've always heard anybody who's heard a clear presentation of the gospel, after the rapture takes place, they're done. But the question is, is what does it mean by that? Rejected the love of the truth. Is that where their mind is actually spiritually enlightened to the place of repentance and they turn from it? And reject it at that point. Tie that over to Hebrews chapter number 6. I think there's some good stuff there. And I've been digging around in that a little bit. And so I'm not done with my study. But I just thought I'd share that with you. Study it, amen. Dig. Look at the Word of God. And, and when you see stuff like that, grab a hold of that thing. Because God will point stuff out to you. Oh, yeah. And ask God to point stuff out to you. And then start digging around in your Bible and find that, figure out what you, see what you can find. Amen. Because there is... Listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach this book until the day I drop dead. And or the rapture happens, and listen, and I'm really just barely, really, you know, honestly, in my lifetime, I'm probably just really turning one page in all of my years of study, and, and think about it, because this thing is a living book, yes. and there's so much here. It's unbelievable. And so, uh, look at it with me, First Peter chapter number 1, that was fun, amen? First Peter chapter number 1. And so let's get back to topic. And uh, 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 18, we're talking about Jesus being the King of kings and that He is talking about the decree that He has given. I declare the decree, and uh, the Lord said unto me, Jesus telling a conversation between Him and the Father, what the Father says to Him. And so look at verse number 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of who? Christ. Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without what? Spot. Who verily was what? Foreordained. Can I get a witness? Before when? The foundation of of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And so when we look at this conversation in Psalm chapter number two, where he says in verse number seven, I declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, past tense hath said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. This is in the Psalms. This is not something that is prophetic of the future. This is something that is telling about the past Amen. before the foundation Amen. of the world. Jesus was foreordained. Amen. Can I get a witness? And he said, this day thou art my only begotten son. And so we see that. And so look at this. This is good stuff. Go over to Revelation chapter number 13. Let's look at that. Revelation chapter number 13. Revelation chapter number 13. Revelation chapter number 13. 
Revelation chapter number 13. God is so faithful, you know. Really is. I just stop and think about how good that he is to me and how faithful he is to me, even though many times I'm just not faithful to him. And it's just amazing. And I stop and think about how the Lord has faithfully worked through the services of Solid Rock Baptist Church. And I'm just going to be honest with you, there's many, many times when I've been up here preaching that I haven't been right with God throughout the years. And then after I'm done preaching that message, people are just like, preacher, that was just wow. And I'm like, it's a good thing God's in control, amen. That's all I can say. You know, because the truth of the matter is, and listen, if, you, if you're thinking bad right now, listen to me. Every preacher is the same way. Every one of them. And they just won't say it, though. Amen? Even Devin. <laughs> Even Devin. I didn't say that. Tony said that. Amen? <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking, man alive. I think I need to pray for you two. Amen? Something's going on here. God help us. Look at verse number 8 of chapter number 13. Verse number 8 of chapter number 13. Look at what it says. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship who? Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the what? Foundation of the world. The book of life of the Lamb slain from when? Well, wait a minute. I thought it just happened 2,000 years ago. That's exactly right. You see, one of the things that we have to realize is when we go to the Bible that God does not live inside of time. Time is a part of this universe. God is not bound by time. When you think about it, the moment you got saved, the Bible says we're seated already in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians chapter number 2. Are you with me? So from the moment I accepted Jesus Christ, it's as if I had always, always, always been in eternity. Wrap your head around that. That's why when you go back to the book of Job and you look at where it talks about how that the sons of God sang. Are you with me? Who are those sons of God? And this is where people get out of shape is because there is nowhere in the Bible that says angels are sons. Nowhere. And so from the moment we're saved, we're in eternity. Eternity doesn't have a beginning or an end. It doesn't have a start point. Are you with me? So this is really mind-blowing, and it's really kind of impossible to wrap your mind around. Just like some of the stuff about God, like His only begotten Son, we're going to look at some verses, and it's just like, what in the world? And so, you know, and I've been trying to wrap my head around this all day as I've been studying to be able to deliver to you so to make some sense. And so, as we look at this and we see this, from the moment I got saved, I've been in eternity with God through creation. When He created everything, yep. I was there. Do you get that? That is like, <laughs> huh? Because you're eternal. And you're in eternity. Eternity has no time. Are you with me? And so that is mind-boggling to me. And that's how come it says in Ephesians chapter number 2, we, it's already present tense. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're there right now. Unbelievable to understand, yet we're still here. And so wrap your head around that one, amen? And so do I get it? Not really, but I know it's true. So you know what I'm saying? And so as we look at this, we see this, Revelation 13, 8, he was slain from the foundation of the world. And so as we look at this, we see this. Uh, let's look at a definition, begotten. The word get is in there. The word procreated is in there. And the word generated is in there. That's what, those are the three words 
that are in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Are you with me? And so begotten. And I've read other commentaries. I've read other definitions. I even looked at the, uh, uh, the uh, Strong's Concordance to get some definitions from them. Uh, to be the son of is one of the definitions. Uh, there's, there's a multitude of definitions. So, well, which one do you pick? The one that fits in the context because the Bible defines its own words. Amen. And so the only begotten son. And so how do you figure that out? Well, Abraham had an only begotten son, and his name was Isaac. But wait a minute. How could Abraham's son Isaac be his only begotten son when he had Ishmael before him? Because that was born of fornication. Are you with me? That was born of fornication, not born of Sarah, and so therefore disqualified to be the only begotten. Isaac was the only begotten son of Abraham. Jesus is the only begotten son of God the Father. Are you with me? Now listen to me. Devin is my only begotten son. He's the only one I got. Amen. I don't have any other sons. He's it. What'd you say? You better not say that, amen. That'd be a lie. Hey, listen, I'm here to tell you something right now. Only begotten son. Listen to me but I could adopt some sons. And then would they be begotten sons? They would be. But they wouldn't be the only begotten son. And you'll see this word first begotten in the Bible as well. Are you with me? Because how did you beget those sons? I adopted them. I begot them. Do you see what I'm saying? I begot them. And the Bible actually says that we're begotten, so I'm going to show you that in just a minute. And so as we look at this, we see this, begotten. Hey, listen, cults misinterpret this. This day have I begotten thee. They think of this begotting as his day of creating when he began to exist. But that's not true about Jesus because Jesus is God. How could God say of Jesus in the book of Revelation, I am the Alpha, the beginning, and the Omega, the the end. Are you with me? And so he couldn't say that. Jesus himself said, hey, listen, I am, he, he professed he was God. And so he wasn't created. He wasn't uh, uh, procreated. He wasn't, he wasn't like God didn't generate him. Amen. Hey, hey, listen, the bottom line is, is he got him. He begot him. He took him as his son. And so because he is God, so he is the only begotten son of God. Can you get it? Are you tracking with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? If not, I'll ramble on for a little bit more until you finally nod your head. <laughs> okay, as we get this, listen to this now. A lot of cults do that. They say that Jesus Christ is not God and always, but, but always was and always will uh, be is, is uh, uh, it's unbiblical and it's absolutely a lie. He is the Alpha and the Omega, amen? He's not a created being. He is God. And so many believe, here's a couple of different beliefs about this, many believe it is a reference to Jesus' incarnation when he was, uh, 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 took on the form of a man, when he became a man, and he became 100% man, becoming a man through the miraculous virgin birth. Of course, we know that this was uh, so that he could become the Savior of the world, and uh, he obviously was still God while he was man. Are you with me? And so why? To redeem mankind. And so look at some verses. Let's look at some verses on this. John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. And I, and I understand why they believe that, but I believe the begotten part, and I think it is a reference to when he was incarnated. It's a reference to that. But God begot him in eternity past, if there's such a thing as eternity past. Are you with me? And so he's begotten. And so John chapter number 1, we're going to look at, of course, some of the verses you very well know. Chapter number 1, verse number 14. John chapter number 1, verse number 14. The Bible says, and the Word, capital W, was made what? Flesh. There's the incarnation. And dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the what? As of the only begotten of the Father. As of the only begotten of the Father. They beheld Jesus in physical form, but the only begotten of the Father was the spiritual form. Are you with me? 
And Jesus' physical form was a representation of who? God the Father. He hath declared Him. We're going to see that in just a second. Look at this now. As of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Don't you just love that? Thank God He's true, and thank God He's got a bunch of grace for us. Amen. Now look at verse number 18 with me. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the what? Bosom of the Father, He hath what? Declared Him. And so Jesus, being incarnated, God Himself, He declared God the Father in physical form so that we could relate. Are you with me? And so we see this right here, and of course, He became the Savior of the world some 33 years after His birth. And so as we look at this, so we see that. Go over to chapter number 3. You know this passage very well as well. And obviously, a very famous verse, John 3, 16. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only, what? Begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Praise God. Verse number 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Are you with me? And so He is the only begotten Son of God. So we see that, yes, in His carnation, He's the only begotten Son of God. I do not believe that at His birth is when that begotten took place. I believe it took place in eternity past according to what we read in the book of Revelation. And in the book of Peter, He was slain from the foundation of the world. Are you with me? And so as we look at this, and we see this. And so uh, go over to Hebrews chapter number 5 with me. Hebrews chapter number 5. I want you to see another angle on this. Hebrews chapter number 5. We're looking at verses that talk about the begotten. Hebrews chapter number 5. I want you to see this. And so somebody who says the begotten took place at his incarnation, I would not tell them they are wrong. I just think it includes that. Are you with me? And so, and, and you know what? If you want to disagree with me, Hey, more power to you. Amen. That's okay. You back it up with the Scripture, I'm with you. I'm for you. Amen. And so I'm just telling you what I, I have come to what I believe it to mean. And so, and it's not heresy. It's not damnable doctrine. So we're okay. We're safe. Everybody okay? Amen. All right. Good. Amen. Hallelujah. Hebrews, where am I? I'm in Timothy. Keep going. All right. Hebrews chapter number 5. Look at verse number 5 with me. Hebrews 5, 5. The Bible says, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, thou art my son. Who said that to him? God the Father. Amen. Said unto him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, thou art a high uh, priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who else, who said that, that he was the order of the high priest, the order after the Melchizedek? Are you with me? And so who said that? God the Father said that of God the Son. Okay? And so God the Father said, this day have I begotten thee. He also said it about his Son. So not only is the high priest the one that can go before us unto God, Jesus, the one that uh, intercedes for us, but also... He is a sacrificial high priest. He was a high priest that died for our sins. Amen? He wasn't just the high priest. He was the high priest that took his own blood because he was also the lamb. And so you think about that. That's an incredible thing. And so pretty awesome. Go over to 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4. First John chapter number 4. Look at verse number 9. And yet there's amen. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent His, what? Mm, sent His, what? Only begotten Son. It's impossible for to Him to send somebody that hasn't been begotten yet. Are you with me? 
it kind of reminds me of people that would argue about Jesus didn't spend three days and three nights in hell. Well, not all of Jesus did, but his soul sure did, because the Bible said, I will not leave thy soul in hell. You can't leave somebody somewhere they haven't been. Are you with me? And so as we look at this, we see this in chapter number 9. It says, manifest love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world. Are you with me? That he might live through him. I think that verse right there really pretty much nails the coffin in. Amen. I mean, it just puts a final nail in there. That's pretty good stuff. But we're going to look at some more stuff. There's another view. Uh, another view is, is that he be, the begotten is talking about his resurrection, not his birth. Now, there is a begotten part of this, but it's not talking about the only begotten son part. It's talking about the first begotten from the dead. Okay, and we're going to look at that. So go over to Acts chapter number 13 with me. Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter number 13. And this is pretty good. Now realize, book of Acts. Do we get our doctrine from the book of Acts? No, we don't. It's a historical book. The book of Acts is writing. Luke wrote down what happened. That's what it is. Luke wrote down what Peter said. That doesn't mean Peter was right about what he said when it comes to doctrine. Are you with me? And so the same thing with the Apostle Paul. Are you with me? And so this is how come we have to be very careful that we don't get confused in Acts when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit and all this other stuff. Because what, what do those people, what do people like Pentecost and... Um, um, Apostolic, apostolics, they speak in tongues. They have these, the gifts of the Spirit and all of these other things that they're expressive about speaking in tongues because they get their doctrine from the book of Acts instead of the epistles that are written to the church. This is a history of what took place in the early church, and that's what we learn from it. We can get a model from it. We can do all kinds of things with it. We can support doctrine with it, but we can't base doctrine off of it. Are you with me? And so, because it is a history book, just like the history book of the United States of America, the real one, there's, there is some, some dark things about America that took place in our history. There was some bad things that happened. Are you with me? There's some bad things in history happening right now. And uh, some things happened just back on the 20th. It was a bad blight for the United States of America. And I think you know what I'm talking about. And so, anyways, as we look at this, we see this. They'll probably be coming to throw me in jail since I'm online. And so they'll be knocking on my door next. So you pray for me. Amen. And uh, just like, do you hear about the fellow in Florida? Journalist, wrote an article. Now he's in jail, looking at 10 years. Because he had a difference of opinion. God help us. Amen. I'm telling you, that's where we're heading. If you hadn't noticed, they've built a fence around D.C. Hmm. That sounds more like Russia, China. You know, they're afraid of their own people. Help us. But anyways, back to the message. Ah, begotten. <laughs> look at Acts chapter number 13. Look at verse number 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I what? And as concerning that, he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on the wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Can I get a witness? And so we see this matter of being begotten. This day have I begotten thee. We see a reference that's talking about the Psalms. It even mentions that. And it says that in the second Psalms. And so we see here in this passage, there's a mention of the resurrection of the dead. But if you'll read it carefully, it is not saying that Psalm chapter number 2 is saying that's what he was talking about. Are you with me? But he is the only begotten son. And so this was before the foundation of the world. And so look at this. Now go over to Revelation chapter number 1. And you're going to see where this ties in with, the, with, with what I'm talking about as far as the first begotten of the dead. Revelation chapter number 1. 
This is really good. I really like this. Now, Jesus was resurrected around 33 years of age. Had anybody else been resurrected from the dead before Jesus was time-wise, date-wise? Lazarus. I think there was a little boy in an upper room that Elijah laid on and breathed life into. Can I get a witness? He was resurrected. Did not Jesus raise up a mother's son before that? And so, uh, yep. And so there's been several people raised from the dead before Jesus was raised from the dead. The difference is, is those folks all died again. <laughs> Are you with me? Now look at this. Revelation chapter number 1, look at verse number 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the what? The first begotten of the dead. Begot means to get. He was the first gotten from the dead. Are you with me? And say, but he wasn't the first ever resurrected. That's why it says, of the dead. Amen? And so the first resurrection took place with Jesus Christ. And listen, Lazarus couldn't have been resurrected if Jesus wasn't going to be resurrected. Are you with me? And here we go with the whole eternity thing again. He was slain before the foundation of the world. Are you with me? He was resurrected before the foundation of the world. Are you with me? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he's in eternity. And so wrap your head around it. Try to figure it out if you can. Amen. If you come up with a good answer, let me know because I'd like to know. Amen. And so because this is eternity. And so as we look at this, he said he's the first begotten of the dead. Not from the dead, of the dead. That's why the King James Bible is so vitally important. Are you with me? Every word does matter. Unto him that loved us and washed uh, us from our sins with his own what? Praise be the Lord. Amen. You ever had a bloodbath? If you're saved in here, you sure have. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so anyways, we see this wonderful thing. And uh, here, let's look at some other verses to consider about this matter of begotten. Let's go to 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter number 4. I want you to see this. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. This is good. And so... First Corinthians chapter number 4, let's take a look at verse number 15. Verse number 15, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have what? Begotten you through the what? Gospel, amen. Paul said, I've begotten you through the gospel. And what? For in Christ Jesus, it was through the gospel of Jesus Christ that you were begotten, okay? And so Paul begot the Corinthians by his preaching of the gospel, and they were begotten of Paul through that preaching. Now, Paul was a saved man. Are you with me? And so a wonderful thing is, is that we can begot other people with the gospel. Are you with me? You preach the gospel to people, and they get saved, they become begotten of you. Amen. And so as we look at this, go to Hebrews chapter number one. Hebrews chapter number one. This is a great verse which I so love. This is a great passage. We'll look at verse number four. Verse number four of chapter number one. Verse number four. This is a great doctrinal passage. There's a lot of great doctrine in Hebrews. Verse number four, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I what? Begotten thee. Now, in order to be a son of God, you must be begotten. Now, Jesus is the only original from the Father begotten. Everybody else comes through Jesus. Amen. Are you with me? The angels are not sons of God. 
And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And, uh, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, talking about Jesus, and saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, is the scepter of thy kingdom. Amen. Amen. And so praise the Lord. We see there that there's another reference to the Psalms, chapter number 2, in reference to, when did I ever say that, to any of the angels. Amen. And I think that's really a slight to Satan himself, because Satan is not a son of God. And the truth of the matter is, I don't believe God would ever send and leave one of his sons to hell or to the lake of fire. Are you with me? He won't. And if angels are sons of God, then the fallen angels are sons of God. Are you with me? And they're not. They're not sons of God at all. And so you say in Job chapter number one, who were those sons of God that came to present themselves before the Lord? Us. Amen. All the saved, the redeemed. Amen. And so we see that. And so Satan came also. And what was he coming to do? He's the accuser of the brethren. He was there to accuse them. So anyways, there's some good doctrine for you. And so anyways, look, uh, go over to Titus chapter number one. Titus chapter number one. Love this. That's good stuff. Uh, that's back two books. Titus chapter number one. Verse number two. This is good. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the what? World began. Before it ever began, okay? And so we see that. Titus chapter number one, verse number two. Go to First John chapter number five. First John five. First John chapter number five. First John chapter number five. First John chapter number five. We still got two more points to go, and they're about as long as the first point. First John chapter number five, verse number one. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Amen. Amen. And every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is what? Begotten of who? Jesus. So we are begotten sons of God. Are you with me? So there it is. And so if you're going to be a son of God, you've got to be begotten of God. You've got to be born again. And so we see this. Now, so we see his position. He is the only begotten son of God. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And because he's the only begotten son of God, he is the heir of the kingdom. Are you with me? So he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so secondly, B, verse number eight, if you would look with me. Secondly, we see in this passage, verse number 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. And so verse number 7, we see his possession. Verse number 8, we see his possession. We see his possession. Jesus uh, is, uh, has right uh, to rule over all the universe, which of course includes the earth. Can I get a witness? He left heaven's throne and became a man, not just to redeem man, but also to to redeem creation, because when man sinned in the garden, all of creation was cursed. The entire universe was cursed. All of the creatures were cursed. Everything was cursed. Amen. Listen, before Adam sinned in the garden, listen, snakes didn't bite and hurt people. Can I get a witness? Animals didn't eat each other. Can I get a witness? It was after all of these things took place that this curse came upon the world. And so John chapter number 17, verse number four, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Amen. And so we see this. Turn over to Romans chapter number 8 with me. Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. I want you to see this. He also, hey listen, just like our bodies are groaning for the redemption, so is the earth. All of creation is. Romans, man, I'm telling you what, my mind is moving slow as molasses. I'm trying to figure out where Romans is in the Bible. And so Romans chapter number 8, verse number 19, verse number 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the what? Sons of God. The manifestation of the sons of God. What's that talking about? 
the manifestation of it. That's where, hey, listen, we're getting our bodies, amen, new bodies, amen, looking forward to the, I don't know about you, but I like new stuff, and I'm looking forward to a new body. Hallelujah, no more ankle pain, wrist pain, elbow pain, joint pain, teeth pain, none of that, amen. Look at it with me, verse number 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Amen. Who's also going to be delivered? The creature, amen. For we know that the whole creation, what? Groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Look at it. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wed the redemption of our bodies. That is talking about that adoption is not talking about like I'm going to adopt some kids. It's talking about the adoption, which is talking about sonship. When a son comes to full maturity and then has the right, all the rights of the father, and when a which in the biblical Bible times that was 21 is when a person actually became an adult, not 18. Amen. And they recognize that in our country because the legal drinking age is 21. Can I get a witness? Because they know from 18, 19, and 20 they're still dumb as a box of rocks. And so anyway. Anyways, listen, the bottom line is this right here. Are you with me? Now, don't get mad about that, amen? That's good stuff. And so the Bible very clearly teaches that. And so in any ways, 21 years old, you know what my opinion is? I don't think 18, 19, and 20 years old should have to go to battle. I don't. I think they should, because that's the children of Israel. In the book of Joshua, it was 21 years up and older that were held, uh, or in the book of Deuteronomy and Exodus, during the, those were the ones that were held accountable for their actions. And they didn't get to go into the promised land. But 20 and under did. Are you with me? Because they weren't accountable to their actions yet. I think God knows better than we do. Amen? And so what do I think? Do you think they shouldn't be allowed in the military? No, I think they should be allowed in, but they should never see battle until they're 21. They should never hit the, the battlefield. They should never be deployed to those places until they're 21. Because when you're 18, 19, and 20, you don't have no more sense than a box of rocks. And when I was 20 years old and I was first in the military, I was so gung-ho to go to war. And it wasn't until another little bit later that I was like, man, was I as stupid or what? I must have been dumb as a box of rocks to want to go and shoot somebody. I, are you with me? It's crazy. And so anyways, that's my thoughts on it anyways. And so there's, there's the thoughts of Jim on that, and that's actually Bible. So anyways, God is good. Look at this now, his possession. And so, hey, listen, he deserves to possess things. Go to Isaiah chapter number 53 with me. Isaiah chapter number 53, we're going to look at some passages about the kingdom, amen. Isaiah chapter number 53. Ah, I've been kind of all over the place because I'm tired. Isaiah chapter number 53, I do apologize for that. Isaiah chapter number 53, verse number 12. If you're there, say amen. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of how many? Many and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. And so he is the Savior of the world. Amen. And so and that is not the verse I was looking for. But anyways, go over to Zechariah chapter number 14. I'm pretty sure this is the right one. Zechariah chapter number 14. But anything that talks about Jesus being the Savior and redeeming many, hey, that's a good verse. Amen. And so I, Zechariah chapter number 14, if you would please. Zechariah, I'm in Ezekiel. Zechariah is the second to the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter number 14 in your Bibles. Look at verse number 9. If you're there, say amen. This is the kingdom set up on earth, and the Lord shall be what? King over how much of the earth? All the earth. And that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. Amen. He is going to be king. That kingdom, he deserves that kingdom. He's the heir to the throne from God the Father. All of those things. Now go back over to Psalm chapter number 22. 
Psalm chapter number 22. I want you to see this. Psalm chapter number 22. Verse number 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the who. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before who? The Lord. Amen. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the what? Nations. Amen. And so we see he is going to rule this earth. He is, he's the possessor of all things, and that includes this earth, and all the nations will bow down and worship him someday. They can try to do it their own way, but they're not going to win. And then lastly, I want you to notice, go back to Psalm chapter number 2. We're done. Psalm chapter number 2, verse number 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Amen. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And so we see he is declaring that he's the only begotten son. He deserves to be the king. He is the savior of all the world. He is going to give him, the heathen, for his inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. He's going to rule everything, talking about the millennium. And during that time and going into that time, he said, don't worry because you're going to rule them with a rod of iron and you're going to dash them in pieces. You have the power. Amen. John chapter number 3, verse number 35, the father loveth the son and hath given given all things in to his hands. How many things? All things. Go over to Colossians chapter number one with me. Colossians chapter number one. Colossians chapter number one in the Bible. Colossians chapter number one. Love this passage. Verse number 15. The Bible says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created. Now, that firstborn is not talking about creation. It's talking about position. It's talking about the uh, lineage, the right, the firstborn. He has the firstborn, the right of the firstborn. Are you with me? For by him were all things created. Now, think about this, and this is a good example. Joseph, uh, 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 Israel comes to Joseph. He has his two sons. Who did Joseph give the blessing to first? The youngest, not the firstborn. He gave the birthright to the youngest instead of the firstborn. And so Jesus is talking about the firstborn of every creature. And Jesus, he wasn't the firstborn. Who was? Adam. But Adam wasn't worthy. The first Adam and the what? Second Adam. Amen. And so he has the right to the firstborn. Are you with me? And so there's all kinds of great doctrine in this. And so verse number 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by what? By him. And for what? For him. Can I get a witness? And he is before all things and by him. How many things consist? all things. The only reason we're sitting in this room right here is because God's holding us together. If God just got sick and tired of all and threw up his hands, we'd all just dissipate into nothingness. That's what would happen. But praise be to God, he is faithful and he's true. So don't lay up tonight worrying about whether you're just going to disappear. And so you won't. And so God is good. Amen. And so he's faithful. And so we see this. Now, those that are foolish enough to resist the Lord Jesus and his rule, God the Father is promising him the power to break them and rule over them. Revelation chapter number two. Go there with me. I really like Revelation chapter number two here. Oh, this is so good. I'm just, my mind is just spinning right now. I'm coming up with all kinds of other great things. I'm trying not to, but it's just... It's just really good stuff. Revelation chapter number 2, or Revelation chapter number 3. Look there with me at verse number 14. I love this. And unto the angel of the church lay out of sins right. Did I miss something? I did. Back to chapter number 2. I did, I did, I missed something. Verse number 26 with me. Chapter number 2, verse number 26. And he that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give what? Power over the nations. 
and he shall rule them with a what? Rod of iron. As the vessels of the potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. You know who else is going to rule with Jesus with a rod of iron? The over, of those that overcome. Now go back to 1 John. You just, i got to show you this. i got to show it to you. First, chapter number 5. Just got to show it to you. It's good stuff. You're going to appreciate this. Chapter number 5. You say, man, the overcomer, man, it seems like they've got to keep these works and they've got to do all this and they've got to be just perfect in order to be one of those overcomers. No, 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 no. You're getting it all wrong. You got to go back to what the Bible says an overcomer is. You got to define what an overcomer is because of what the Bible defines an overcomer is. Now, look with me, if you would, in verse number four. For whatsoever is born of God, what? Overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our what? Faith. For by grace are you saved through what? Faith, and that not of yourselves. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of who? God. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Are you born again? The Bible says you're an overcomer. Amen. And you and I are going to rule with God the Father with an iron rod. And I'm excited about it. Amen. All those people that have defamed and cussed out our God, we're going to get to break them into shivers pieces. You say, that's not loving. There's a lot of not loving in the Bible, amen. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Can I get a witness? I'm sorry, but these people that hate God, I'm having a hard time not being angry at them. And listen, He's my God. He's my Savior. He died for me. He shed His blood. Are you with me? And man, I'm thinking that there ought to be some righteous indignation, some righteous anger. Be angry and what? Sin not. So you can be angry and not sin. Amen. And some of these reprobates that hate God and curse our God and stand up against our God and would rather worship Satan than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm thinking they deserve some righteous anger from the children of God. And we ought to get a little bit angry about those. And we live in a society today in this so-called New Age Christianity. Oh, you got to be loving and compassionate to everybody. I don't see that in my Bible. David, he prayed some pretty rough things on his enemies. Can I get a witness? Mm. Help us, Jesus. i got to move along. I don't want to, but I want to stay here and just preach a while. Go to Revelation chapter number 20. We're going to close it up with this. Revelation chapter number 20. Hey, listen, he is going to rule for a thousand years on this earth. Amen. He is going to rule. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Look at verse number four with me. Revelation 20. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, for in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ, what? A thousand years. But verse number five, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Think about that. What's the point of this? God's position is secure. He's powerful and he possesses how much of it? All of it. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. Listen, if they start throwing us in jail, it'll be okay. You just sing praises to Jesus and just be faithful and love God and tell people about Jesus and be faithful. And if there's anything this should do is let us know that, you know what, I've got loved ones and I don't want them to go through the tribulation. I don't want them to die and go to hell because... If they die without Jesus, then they're going to be 
they're not going to be, they're going to be in hell for a thousand years before they're even judged at the white throne, the great white throne of judgment. They're going to be there for a thousand years waiting to be judged. And it's not going to get better from hell because the lake of fire is worse than hell. Are you with me? And so that should cause us to be very busy pleading with the people that we love, the people around us, the people that we don't know. Because the truth of the matter is, is they're no more deserving of hell than we are. Amen? Jesus Christ, our Savior, is in charge. And the devil and all those that do his bidding, they're in big, big trouble. And we better be busy reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those God-haters, those scorners, you know, I felt really bad about that guy in the sign ministry when he drove by and he gave me the bird. He flipped me off at first. I, sh I, I laughed at first. And then I began to feel bad because of his destination. Are you with me? Well, he's a God hater. And you know what? If I had an opportunity to talk to him, I'd probably speak pretty roughly with him. I'd probably, look at what, one, one verse, and I'm done. Go to, go to Jude, book of Jude. You've got to have discernment with who you're talking to. Are you with me? You've got to discern who you're dealing with. This, this uh, lovey-dovey Christianity stuff that we're living in today that's spread across this nation. I read an article from uh, O. Timothy about Hiles. I'm telling you, Hiles Anderson is a wicked... Jack Hiles was a wicked man. His son is wicked. He took a church in Texas, and there is a reported 19 different women that he slept with when he was there. Wicked, and his dad knew it. And he sent him away. He'd been sleeping with teenage girls because he was the youth pastor in Hiles. And his dad knew it and covered it up. Wicked. They used to have reported thousands of teenagers getting saved. <sighs> Wicked. Wicked. God deliver us from that kind of Christianity. Amen. Amen. Look at this now. Jude chapter number 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. If you keep yourself in the love of God because your pastor is a godly man, as soon as I fall in the ministry, if I were to fall in the ministry, you're, you're looking at the wrong dude. You better keep your eyes on Jesus and stay in love with him yourself. Are you with me? And too many people are, this is what Hiles did, was he created man worship. They used to throw money up on the stage to this man. He was like some kind of superstar. Are you with me? And it's wicked is what it was. It wasn't right. It wasn't, listen, it's bad. It's man worship. And the devil loved every minute of it. And his son-in-law took it over and was sleeping with a teenage girl in his 50s and took her across line and he got busted for it and he's sitting in jail right now because of it. Great history in that place. Are you with me? Now look at it. I'm sorry, but it, it, it burns me up. Verse number 22, because people are all about bigger, better, more numbers. What are you doing to get those numbers? What are you sacrificing to get those numbers, I should say? Verse number 20, and look at what it says. Verse number 22, and of some, of all, of some have compassion, making a what? And others, save with what? Fear. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Some people, yes, compassion, but others, fear. Fear is the only thing that's going to get them out. That's what it's going to take. 
But sadly, we are too much of a coward today to get blunt and bold and courageous with people. And people mock people saying, turn or burn. I had somebody recently say that they're ob- some people are obnoxious in their soul winning efforts. And some of you in here heard those words. And if you didn't know it, that was a punch at us for our sign ministry. Are you with me? I'm sorry, but holding Scripture signs downtown, even if they say, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God, are you with me? Listen, I'm here to tell you something right now. Somebody better get bold and a little obnoxious with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And having on my bumper, eternity is a long time. Eternity in hell is a long time to be wrong. Oh, that's so offensive. God! Maybe they'll wake up a little bit and stop and think about that a little. Are you with me? God help us. We have become such cowards in our soul winning. We should not be ashamed. We should be proud of our Savior and our God and the truth He's given us. And yes, there are some we need to have compassion with, but there are others that we need to save with fear pulling them out of the fire. The truth of the matter is, the devil and his crowd are in big trouble. The lost are in big trouble, and we better reach him while we can. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's not going to become the King of kings and Lord of lords. He already is. He already is the Savior. He's already in charge. He's already ruling. Even though they are not bowing the knee yet, they will. And every last one of them that has ever rebelled against God and died, every one of them is going to bow the knee to our God. They're all going to. And so we have nothing to fear, amen? For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Get out there and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and win souls for the cause of Jesus. Tell the truth. And if you get a little rough with some people because they're not listening and they're not getting it, then praise be to God. Because if we don't shake them awake out of their apathy, in the direction they're going in, they're going to die and go to hell. And you sit and you talk to some people and they just got like a glaze over their eyes and they're not even listening. Are you with me? And those times when I have that happening, that's when it's time to get a little bit <clears throat> and shake them a little bit. And hopefully something will happen to, to wake them up to where then all of a sudden they're concerned and they're realizing that something's going on. Are you with me? Everyone's standing, every head bowed, every eye closed. Listen, I don't know what's going on in your life tonight. I don't know what's been happening over the last few weeks or what's happened today. I don't know what you're looking forward to tomorrow and what you have to face tomorrow. But you know what? God is in control. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Nothing on this earth happens without his allowance. Are you with me? Nothing. And you can count on him. He is faithful and he is true. Are you with me? Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. God, help us to be courageous soul winners. Lord, help us to recognize the fact that you are in control. You have provided salvation. And you are the King of kings. And God, help us to live in the knowledge of your sovereignty and that you have a sovereign plan. And Lord, there is going to be a thousand-year reign of Christ, and we, the saved, are going to get to rule with you. And Lord, I pray, O God, that you'd help us now in this time to be busy occupying until you come, gaining ground, not losing ground. Father, work and move as only you can. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Amen. If God spoke to your heart, you come on the piano's playing.